So, for example, uh, I could think that let us say I have these two head domains of my motor that bind to the that bind to the filament right. Let me draw it a little bigger. So, these are my two head domains and then here is a carbo binding domain. Now, how do these head domains move when it walks? So, you could think of two things. So, for example, here are my two head domains. It could pivot on this leg and then turn this leg and move and then again pivot on this and move the other leg or it could move both legs. So, it moves this one forward a little bit and this one forward a little bit right. So, these are what is shown over here as this uh, this pivoting one is what is called the hand over hand. So, you press one hand and you pivot on that the other one is called the sort of inchworm movement ok. And if you work out the numbers. So, if you let us say you place a fluorescent tag on one of these heads then if it was hand over hand it would have this leg would have unbound from here and then pivoted on this hinge and bound to somewhere over here. And the distance for so, the distance that this head would cover in a single step would be of the order of somewhere around 74 nanometers. Whereas, if it was doing this sort of inchworm movement where both of these heads move simultaneously each head would move an order of 36 nanometers given this kind of synchrony. So, you can now construct you can now do this single bead uh, sort of experiments and you observe the position as a function of time the position of this motor on the on the filament as a function of time and you can plot an histogram let me I think you have the histogram yeah. So, you can plot the position as a function of time and you can plot the histogram of step sizes that it takes. So, for example, here you can see that the histogram has a peak at around somewhere around 74, 75 nanometers, which what it says is that the motion that this kinesin is doing is not this inchworm, which would then have a peak around 36, but rather this sort of a hand over hand motion, where it and it has the peak at the right uh, sort of dis displacement of around 74 nanometers. You can also explicitly actually see that in certain experiments. So, here is another experiment. So, this is the kinesin, this is one head domain, this is another. So, this one stays bound, it uh, the other one hinges around. So, the other one has now unbound in this middle panel, this one stays bound, ok. And then this other one comes and attaches forward over somewhere over here, ok. So, this directly shows this sort of a hand over hand movement. So, th and this is the schematic. So, this one stays bound, this one unbinds, it finds and again binds at the next position. Yes. What is the? What is the assay? Gliding. What is meaning of assay? Assay means to sort of I do not know. It means to study at least colloquially the actual Greek Latin meaning is what I do not know. I, it can have some root, but uh, technically for colloquially what I understand is some sort of a study all right. So, these sort of experiments can tell us how these motors in fact are moving. And you can do this for different uh, types of motors kinesin versus dynein and so on and see what sort of uh, mechanisms are different from one motor versus the other. All right. So, if I wanted to go ahead and build models of these sort of things these sort of translational motors uh, kinesins, dyneins, myosin something like that walking on some sort of track microtubules or actins what sort of questions could I ask for example. So, I could ask things like uh, what is the mean velocity of a motor? I could ask how does this mean velocity depend on the force right this v is a function of f how does that behave? Um, I could ask what is the stall force of the motor? The stall force is again simply the force required to st bring the motor to a stop ok. I could ask how does this velocity depend on the concentration of ATP right. So, I have said that this is a function of f but in principle it is also a function of ATP concentration because these are active processes. If you did not have any ATP the motors would not move at all. If you had very high ATP it would move with some velocity in between ATP in between ATP concentrations it would move with some other velocity. So, not only is it a function of force, 
it is also a function of the ATP concentration because you have to couple this chemical cycle of this ATP hydrolysis to the mechanical cycle of this motor stepping. You could ask that how stochastic are these motor trajectories uh, for example, just to show one here it is these are sort of stochastic events in that it is not that it takes a step at every fixed interval of time, it stays bound for some time and that time interval it stays bound can vary uh, from step to step. So, these are inherently stochastic processes. So, how do I model this sort of a process? You could also ask that how do these binding and unbinding rates uh, of the motors themselves depend on force. So, like I said these motors can bind with some rate let us say k on and it unbinds with some rate let us say k off and these forces these rates can themselves be functions of time right. So, for example, if I was pulling on this motor and it was bound uh, then I could imagine that maybe the harder I pull maybe it will be easier to unbind the motor right. So, this unbinding rate would then have a dependence on force um, and naively I would say that the higher the force the higher the unbinding rate ok. But how do these depend for different types of motors could be a valid question ok. So, there are different so some of these could be inputs of your model some of them could be outputs of your model, but in you want to answer sort of all of these uh, sort of questions. So, I will not go into the models today, but uh, okay, let me show a couple more things. So, for example, this stall force that I was talking about. Uh, so, if you look at uh, so, these are these are cargo trajectories. So, these are cargoes carried by dynines either in inside a test tube or inside cells and you can look at these trajectories and you can construct histograms that of the stall force, the force that is required uh, to stall the motion of the cargo completely. And you will see that these stall forces have peaks at let us say inside the cell it has peaks at around 1 piconewton, 2 piconewton, 3 piconewton which you would then interpret by saying that this is a sort of cargo that was being carried by only one dynein motor ok. So, when you applied 1 piconewton of uh, force that dynein came to a stop maybe this cargo was being carried by 2 dynein motors. So, you needed 2 piconewtons of force to sort of bring it to a stop and so on this was carried by 3 and so on. Inside the cells, um, so most um, cargo in the in vitro was carried by one dynein, single dynein motor, whereas inside cells, uh, most cargo would be carried by somewhere around seven to nine dynein motors, okay, because the peaks are somewhere around seven point seven or nine point seven piconewton. So per dynein motor, the stall force is roughly around one piconewton, at least for this class of dynein's. There are other classes where the numbers might change. But for this class, it's around one. So depending on where you get the peak in the in the stall force histogram, you might be able to say how many motors were carrying a single cargo. So one of the questions that we I had asked was to say that well, when I have these cargos which are being carried by multiple multiple types of motors, not only multiple motors, so kinesins as well as dynines, how do I sort of how do I get sort of transport? And one of the most uh, common models or one of the most canonical models is one of the simplest ones. It says that this cargo motion is ultimately regulated by some sort of a tug of war ok. So, tug of war is a mechanism for bidirectional transport. So, you have these kinesin motors which exert some force in this direction, you have these dynein motors which exert some force in this direction and the cargo will move in a resultant direction given by the balance of the forces between these two. And here the so, for example, the dynines want to move this way. So, they exert so, I do not have any optical trap or anything. So, these dynines want to move this way. So, therefore, they exert a force on the kinesins. Similarly, the kinesins want to move this way therefore, they exert a force on the dynines ok. So, the forces generated are internal and each motor feels the force generated by the opposite type of motors. So, this is sort of a canonical model it says that there is a tug of war um, if the forces sort of balance each other then you. So, if kind of let us say this is uh, my cargo trajectory as a function of time let us say x is a function of time x being the position along the microtubule. So, let us say if kinesins win then I will move along the plus end I will move along the plus end roughly if at some point some kinesins unbind and dynesins dynesins win then maybe I will 
you know start walking in the other direction. If the forces are balanced I could have no net motion and so on. So, you will see some sort of a stochastic trajectory like this. So, it is a tug of war uh, between these kind these oppositely directed motors kinescence and dynemes and what I will ultimately see it depends on the number of so therefore, the number of motors of each type that are bound at a given time. There is also um, sort of uh, so this is this model is now roughly some 10 12 years old and it has a lot of experimental support, but on the other hand it has some experiments which say that this is not exactly right. So, for example, if I said that um, I have this uh, cargo which could be bound by both kinescence and dynenes and let us say somehow I manage to make all kinescence inactive. Then I should see according to this model uh, this sort of a tug of war model I should see that all my cargo has now walked towards the minus end and everything is bunched up towards the minus end. Similarly, if I somehow manage to inactivate the dynene motors and I only had kinescence then everything would walk towards the plus end and I would see all sort of cargo bunched up at the plus end. So, here is an experiment that sort of tries to test that. So, here is a particular cell. So, this is a normal cell and you have some distribution of cargo. So, the minus ends of so, this is the cell body the minus ends of microtubules are over here the plus ends are over there along these tips ok. And in a normal cell you have some distribution of cargo some here some here and so on. If you now sort of uh, deplete dynein. So, you make some sort of genetic modification. So, that the dynenes do not get uh, are not functional anymore. You would imagine that the kinescence win over in this tug of war sort of a scenario and all all the cargo now gets bunched up at the plus ends right. So, everything is now at the tips there is nothing at the center. On the other hand if you deplete kinescence uh, which is this experiment you would uh, sort of uh, expect according to this tug of war picture that all the cargo are now in the cell body over here and there is nothing at the tips. Uh, this cartoon is somewhat different from this because in this uh, modification the cell itself changes shape a little bit from this sort of shape to this sort of shape. But anyway you would expect all the cargo to be at the cell center. So, that is the naive expectation. You now do these experiments. So, this is the control experiment, this is the experiment where there is no dynenes, this ex experiment where there are no kinescence and if you see that the distribution of cargo actually does not change much at all. Uh, so, if in this picture it might be a little difficult to make out. If you look at the histograms, so these the yellow parts of the histogram histogram are the cargoes which are towards this tip and this blue are the cargoes that are towards the shaft ok. So, this is the control cell, this one is the cell where I think this is where dynenes were inactivated and this is the cell where kinescins were inactivated. Sure, there is some change in the numbers, but it is not like in this one everything has gone the blue has taken over or in this one the yellow has taken over. So, you maintain a sort of similar concentration of cargo which end up in the tip versus which end up in the shaft irrespective of whether you have done these dynein mutations or these kinescent mutations. In fact, there is other experiments which show that if you inactivate any one of these type of motors the cargo as a whole stops moving instead of going zooming across to the other end it sort of mo stops moving at all which basically says that there is some sort of regulation of each of these motors by the other. You need both of these in order to see motion inside of cells ok. So, there is some sort of regulation uh, of these mo amongst these motors themselves and if you just inactivate one type of motor uh, you can even find that all motion inside the cell has stopped. So, again this is not very well understood how this regulation happens uh, there are models, but it is not very clear as to what the answer is. So, these are all open questions as to how this sort of transport happens right. So, another sort of puzzle is what I was saying about dynenes and that dynenes are somewhat different from kinescence dynenes are somewhat more complicated motors. Uh, so, kinescence versus dynenes, kinescence versus dynenes. And to show that what you can do is that you can try to estimate the unbinding rate of dynenes or kinescence as a function of the force. And here is what sort of experiments you would do. 
So, let us say again this is uh, experimental trajectories. Uh, so, this is position along the axis as a function of time ok. So, what you do is that you let your cargo walk along your microtubule ok. Once it stalls you move. So, these are moving in an optical trap sort of a setup. So, this is my optical trap you move the optical trap a little bit. So, that you can control the force that this cargo feels ok. And then you observe how long does this motor stay bound under this force before it unbinds. You measure this. So, this is when I turn my trap on like this you measure how long it stays bound before it falls off. You do this many many times and you can measure the average of this residence time as a function of the force that you apply. So, these are different experiments. So, you do this experiment many many times thousands of times and you get some sort of an average that depending on the force that you are applying using this optical trap how long does this motor stay bound and you can do it for kinescence and dynes. So, for example, here is the curve for kinescence which says that the more load that load is an opposing force. So, like here the more force that you apply in the opposing direction the smaller my residence time ok, which is sort of what I would expect that if I am pulling on this motor opposite to the direction that it wants to go in. If you pull on this in the opposite direction I would expect that you know it comes off more often or it stays bound for a less amount of time ok. So, and that is what this kindness ensures that the more load I put the residence time sort of decreases. On the other hand dynein show very different behavior it shows in fact, the opposite behavior. So, the more I sort of pull on this the more more time it spends bound to the filament. So, the more the opposing force the more tightly it sort of stays bound to the filament. This is very counterintuitive uh, most motors do not behave like this which is why this sort of an unbinding rate has or this sort of a bond which sort of strengthens under force under an opposing force has a special name it is called a catch bond. Whereas, this other bond the like in uh, kinesin. So, this is for dynenes, this is for dynenes. Whereas, for kinesin, the standard expectation where you know the unbinding rate sort of increases with force. So, the residence time decreases that is sort of an example of a slip bond. So, from these sort of experiments by measuring the residence times you can construct actually um the unbinding rates. You can construct the unbinding rates and here is what let us forget about. So, this is basically that sort of a setup where you do it at different forces. Ultimately, what you get out of it is this dissociation rate the unbinding rate for dynins and for kinescins. So, initially for both there is a regime where the dissociation rate increases with force, but then beyond a certain force which in fact happens to be the stall force of these motors kinesin keeps on increasing again there is a discontinuous dip, but it keeps on increasing whereas dynenes actually decrease. So, in this regime is where this catch bond comes into play and the more force you apply the smaller the dissociation rate or higher the residence time ok. So, when you are building models for these sort of motors a model that works for kinesin would be very different from a model that works for dynene because you have to take into account this difference of the nature not just the number, but the nature of these unbinding rates or these residence times. So, I will talk a little bit about some of these models next class, uh, but in a very generic sense let me say that what sort of models can I build? Uh, what I can say is that these motors. Um, so, one ca characterization of these motors is where they are on the track. So, if I label my tracks n minus 1 n n plus 1. So, this is the position along the track it is a lattice. So, it is a sort of lattice given by this uh, alpha beta tubulin or this actin monomer uh, subunit ok. So, it is a discrete random walk where these motors can hop from one unit of the lattice to another. So, you label the units of the lattice and you could ask what is the probability of finding a motor in the nth box versus the n plus 1 nth box versus so on. But additionally you could have various internal states of these motors you could have I do not know some n number of steps or t number of steps in this case it could be whether ATP is bound uh, whether ATP is hydrolyzed if there are conformational states of the motor that it takes uh, for example, this active versus inactive uh, state of myosin uh, 
all of these could be variables in the modeling and then you could ask that what is the probability to find the emth motor uh, sorry to find the motor in the emth state at position n at time t ok. And you could write down master equations for this sort of a probability quantity ok. So, you could take into account the internal states of these motors by coupling the chemical cycle or whatever other conformational states that you have the positions of these motors along the track and the time itself and then write down evolution equations for these probabilities and in maybe under certain approximation solve them as well. So, that is what we will try to do. I will just leave you with the zeroth order uh, sort of model in this sense which is that I forget all about internal states I just consider the position and this motor can hop forward with some rate k plus and hop backward with some rate k minus. Unlike a standard random walk because these motors have directionality the two hopping rates will not be equal right it will be greater in one direction versus the other. And then you could write down what is the probability to find in position n at time t plus delta t by looking at all the possible hops ok. So, this is a hop from n minus 1 to n with a rate with a probability k plus delta t a hop from n plus 1 to n with a probability k minus delta t and some probability of staying at that same position. So, this is the discrete version you can take the continuum limit of this to write down how these probabilities change in time and what that would simply give you the drift diffusion equation right. So, if you took the continuum version you would just get some del p del t is minus v del p del x plus d del 2 p del x 2 where this velocity would be the difference of these two rates the forward and the backward the diffusion constant would be the average of these rates and of course, the lattice constant t is square. So, this in some sense the zeroth order I have not considered any of the complexities of these real motors that I was talking about. What I will try to do over the next class uh, is to sort of bring in some of this complexity that we described today and within this sort of a master equation framework and see how that changes the equations and how to study these equations ok ok. So, I think I will stop here for today and continue.